often get, well, what about the red shift? Doesn't that prove the universe is expanding? Or doesn't that prove the universe is billions of years old? Let me explain what they're talking about. If light shines through a prism, it breaks it up into the rainbow colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, okay? Well, if you take starlight and shine it through a prism by putting a prism on the back of your telescope, you look at the star, the light comes through, and it gets broken up into the same red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And you can kind of tell what's burning because different things burn different colors, like copper burns green. And each element produces a distinctive color. And so they can kind of tell what's in the star and what, how it's burning by what color of light it produces. So there's, you can learn a lot about the star from the light. However, as they look at the spectroscope, the colors it produces, there's little black lines in starlight indicating something's burning, a particular element's burning, but they're shifted toward the red. If you notice the, the center picture up there, the it's black lines are shifted over toward the red side, and that's called the red shift. So the question is, what would be causing this? Why would some of these stars have the black lines shifted over toward the red? Well, there are several theories about what's causing it. The most commonly accepted theory, and probably the only one that students are ever taught in school, is that the red shift is caused by what's called the Doppler effect. If you've been waiting at the train tracks when a train is coming, as the train's coming toward you, it is squeezing the sound waves, and so the pitch goes up. And when the train leaves you, it is stretching the sound waves, and so the pitch drops, and it goes as it goes by. That's called the Doppler effect. Who cares? Well, this happens, okay, whether the sound is moving past you or you moving past the sound, it doesn't matter. You still get this Doppler effect, the change in pitch. Well, the theory is that if a star was moving toward us, it would squeeze the light waves, giving it a blue shift, and if it is leaving us, it would give us a red shift because it would stretch the light out. That's the theory, okay? What really causes it? I don't think anybody knows for sure. This guy said there was an early sign that red shifts reliably indicate the distance to quasars. For quasars, however, the diagram shows a wide scatter in apparent brightness at every redshift. In fact, there is little correlation of brightness to redshift at all. Either quasars come in an extremely wide range of intrinsic luminosities, or, as most people believe, or their dist redshifts do not indicate distance. I don't think anybody knows for sure what's causing the redshift, but you certainly can't tell the distance to a star based on the redshift, and that's exactly what they try to do. They look at stars and say, oh, that one's redshifted more. That must be, you know, 10 and a half billion light years away instead of 10.2 or something. They make up an awful lot of imagination stuff over just a real little bit of science, in my opinion. This fellow said in uh, uh, Sky and Telescope magazine, thus, for us, the only conclusion that can be drawn <coughs> is that at least some quasars are relatively nearby and a large fraction of their redshift is due to something other than expansion of the universe. Basically, he's saying, we're not sure exactly what's causing the redshift. It might be that they're nearby. There's a good uh, book you can get, and I highly recommend this one, called The Evolution Cruncher. It's a 900-page book, and it's like five bucks. He's got a whole section in here on page 52 about the evolution, uh, about the uh, red shift and the Doppler effect and what, what causes it. Got some really good stuff in these you can give out, give out to every high school kid you know. But there's a good section in there uh, about the, the red shift, what's causing it. This article says quasars with an enormous redshift was found embedded in a nearby spiral galaxy with a far, far lower redshift. Now how can one star be inside of another star and they're giving you two different redshifts if this indicates distance? If they're the same, if a quasar is inside a galaxy, they should both give you the same redshift, both be the same distance away. But they admitted they found this uh, quasar inside of a galaxy that had different redshifts, but yet they're obviously the same distance away. So they said, according to the standard Big Bang view of the universe, the objects we call quasars are generally supposed to be at the very edge of the visible universe. They're supposed to be superluminous black holes with a million or a hundred million times more mass than our sun, surrounded by a disk of matter, or material. Some of the material falls into the black hole, causing the emission of huge amounts of energy. There was a big article when they discovered this a cosmic a discovery. Discovery poses cosmic puzzle. Can a distant quasar live within a nearby galaxy? This really created a problem. Uh, how on earth can we have these two objects that are different distances at the same location? Well, it's not a problem if you realize that you can't trust the redshift to measure the distance. But they're so anxious to say the universe is billions of light years across, and it probably is, and then use that as evidence to say, therefore, it's billions of years old. And that's why this all becomes a problem for them. If they would just accept the Bible, it wouldn't be a problem at all. This article said, uh, Quasar with enormous redshift found embedded in nearby spiral galaxy with far lower redshift. Unsolvable riddle for Big Bang astronomy. I agree. If you believe the Big Bang theory, that is an unsolvable problem. 
Science News ran an article that said, Another set of observations indicates that the universe appears to be 8.4 to 10.6 billion years old. The new work relied on Hubble Space Telescope to obtain distance to faraway galaxies. The team led by uh, Tanver of the University of Cambridge in England used a two-step method to estimate the Hubble constant. Now stop and think about that. How many of you have had algebra before? You had algebra? You have variables in your equation, okay? Well, if one a variable times a constant, if one constant changes, that's going to change your whole answer. So most of this distance stuff they're doing with stars is based on what they call the Hubble constant. But they don't even know what that is. The Hubble constant is estimated. Well, that's going to radically affect your outcome of your equation. So is the universe uh, 8.4 billion years old, or is it 10.6, or is it, uh, when I debated Hugh Ross at Reasons to Believe, he said it's 17.42 billion years old. 17.42, how do you know that? Some textbooks say 18, some say 20, some say 12. The numbers range all over the scale. The fact is, they don't know. They're making up numbers, purely making them up. The article goes on to say, you have to be very careful about drawing conclusions because of the Hubble constant. Measurements have huge systematic errors. Now, I like this article. It came out in Discover Magazine a couple years ago. Astronomers believed the veil, one of the best studied supernova remnants, was 2,500 light years away and 18,000 years old. They were quite wrong. In fact, the veil is only 1,500 light years away and 5,000 years old. So here just four years ago, they're discovering they got radically wrong numbers. How do you know any of the numbers they're telling us are right? I think we should say, look, until somebody's proven the Bible wrong, I'm going to believe it. Instead of saying, well, the scientists are saying it's wrong, so therefore we must believe the scientists. <laughs> Don't go along with that. Even the nearest Cephids, a Cephid variable, are so remote, it's difficult to determine their absolute distance with any great accuracy. All large distances in astronomical literature are subject to an error of perhaps 10% from this cause alone. There are lots of different things that can cause errors in these measurements. We talked about the measuring, the triangulation, measuring with trigonometry. You got incredible errors built into that. The numbers are just so big. The distances are so large you can't do it. They say we know that faintness, that's how bright the star is, arises from two causes, distance and absorbing matter in space. This was happening. They look at a star and say, wow, we know that one is, you know, four billion light years away. And look at that one over there, that one's only half as bright. So it must be, you know, 8 billion light years away. They use the inverse square law. And that's all logical if there's nothing in between absorbing the light or scattering the light. Just because a star is dimmer doesn't necessarily mean it's farther. It might be uh, something's in between, a dust cloud. Outer space, space is full of all kinds of stuff. Anyway, the guy admits it's, generally not, it's not generally possible to apportion it between the two. There's more about Halton Harp and what uh, happened to him, the persecution that happened to him because he dared to question the redshift. All he did was expose the problems with it. He said, guys, that redshift has problems. Oh, well, then you're fired and you get out of here and don't you ever come back, you know, until <laughs> you repent. Because you just don't question some things. They're sacred. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, that God stretched out the heavens. Isaiah 45, he stretched out the heavens. Jeremiah, he stretched out the heavens. 17 times in the Bible, it says God stretched out the heavens. Now, what does that mean? Well, I would guess it means he stretched out the heavens. Okay? I don't know that anybody knows, but here's a couple of options of what may be causing this redshift. Keep in mind, the redshift is probably the only bit of scientific data that is used to support the Big Bang Theory. They look at the stars and say, wow, redshift, 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 all these stars are moving away. What does that mean? Oh, that means they used to be all in one spot. So the evidence for the Big Bang is the redshift. And the Big Bang's got to be one of the dumbest theories in the history of humanity. Here's some things that might be causing the redshift. It could be the stretching from the creation. If the stars are moving away because they're being stretched out or were stretched out, that would cause a redshift. It could be the light's getting tired. I get tired. I don't know if light does or not. We know that light going through a prism bends because different wavelengths are different energy levels. That's why it breaks, makes, makes the rainbow. Okay? Maybe it's just the effects of traveling through space. Is space really nothing or is there something in space? Is light going through anything when it goes through space? I don't know. I just one thought. Maybe it is the Doppler effect. Could be. Maybe it's light being slowed down or speeded up by a black hole. Robert Gentry's got a great article in his uh, uh, website, halos.com. If you want to read more about the redshift and the problems with it, get all the technical stuff. But when you talk about the stars, there's a good book here by uh, Brian Young. 
called The Stars, God's Word in the Sky. You can get it from our ministry, 10 bucks. Great book on the, the stars. Christians shouldn't be afraid of astronomy. Now, astrology is different, but not astronomy. God created everything. Here's a book, Astronomy in the Bible. I don't know if this one's available from our website or not, but uh, we can get it. Donald DeYoung. It is, Jonathan? Yeah, it's on our website. Awesome book, Astronomy and the Bible, if you want to read more. Because I think we should study astronomy, study what God has made. This book is a little controversial. D. James Kennedy, Coral Ridge Ministries, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He says the real meaning of the zodiac, he goes through the, the 12 zodiac symbols and says probably these originally had a gospel story to them, which has now been perverted into the horoscope. So get CoralRidge.org if you want to get the book. It's like six or eight bucks. But the Bible does talk about the constellations. It talks about Pleiades and Orion in the book of Job chapter 38, or Maseroth and Arcturus in Job 38. There are constellations mentioned in the Bible. Now what does this mean? Well, I don't know, and I don't know anybody who knows for sure, but here's what some Christians think. That when God originally made the world, Adam did not have a Bible. It hadn't been written yet. So God gave Adam the gospel story in the stars. The 12 different constellations told the story of the redemption, the coming of Christ, and maybe they, the, the Sphinx was built, this is a, one theory, the Sphinx by the pyramid, you know, in Egypt, they say, well, the Sphinx was built to tell us how to read the zodiac, because it starts with the face of a woman and ends with the body of a lion. So you start reading the zodiac. Instead of starting in January like we do, you start with Virgo the Virgin, and you go through the 12 constellations and end with Leo the Lion. I don't know. I know that today the horoscope's all perverted and Satan always takes what God does and twists it and perverts it and changes it, but if you want to study that, that's fine. There appears to be something to that, though, that maybe there really is something to this gospel in the stars. And Carl Baugh's got a good theory that each of the constellations is producing different radio waves. <coughs> stars produce radio waves. He thinks the canopy of ice that used to be above the Earth could actually change those radio frequencies into audible waves, like a crystal radio does. It would actually vibrate. And Adam and Eve would be able to hear the music of the stars mentioned in Job chapter 38. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it sure preaches good that the whole gospel story was being sung to them continually as they traveled around every year. Who knows? Anyway.